and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to September 1984 to get all the latest Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games. We look back at tape magazines. We review some older games. And check out some newer titles. But first, I'd like to thank all the people who have viewed, subscribed and commented on my video channel. Thanks very much guys, it really does make a difference. Right, on with this episode, and back into the time machine for September 1984. It's been brought to light that a Portuguese company has been pirating software on a massive scale, causing many UK companies to take action. A company called Microbait Software has been copying games, duplicating cassette inlays and putting games on sale illegally. Each tape they sell includes two top selling Spectrum games, all duplicated without permission from the actual companies. At least a hundred of the games are from Quicksilver and managing director Rod Cousins is not impressed. Other companies affected include Melbourne House, Scion, Ocean, Houston, Ultimate Play the Game, Silversoft, Bugbite, Microgen, Arctic and practically all well-known software houses. The first cordless joystick has been released for the Spectrum, with versions for other computers planned. The Remote Access Transmitter, or RAT for short, operates in the same way as a television remote control, using infrared for sending commands to an interface connected to the Spectrum. Cheetah, who manufactured the device, say it can be used up to 30 feet away, and is already compatible with games like Attic Attack, Hunchback and Trashman. Virgin Games are to change their strategy for software and concentrate on quality rather than quantity. Many of their older games that they now call not so good are to be reduced in price to clear stocks. These include Falcon Patrol and Racing Manager. Virgin will be working towards releasing fewer titles but of a higher quality. Automata UK announced that its next game will be totally new concept in computer entertainment. Deus Ex Machina includes a real-time soundtrack featuring the voices of John Pertwee, Ian Jury and Frankie Howard, accompanied by professionally recorded music. The player guides a life form from birth to death, with the sole aim of living a good life. The gameplay is split into different sections, each with its own challenges and different accompaniment. Ubix game Paranoid Pimp has been pulled from the shelves after a complaint from Weetabix. Initially, the Tyneside Company were working with Weetabix to produce a game featuring the breakfast cereal characters as seen in the company's adverts, but Weetabix were unhappy with the result. Ubik made the changes requested so they could publish the game, but Weetabix were still not happy. The game has now been shelved, and Ubik will concentrate on their newer titles. It seems like every month sees another computer software company going to liquidation, and this month is no different. Digital Fantasia, the company producing adventure games, have now slipped under, but their games have been taken over by another company, Channel 8. Channel 8 will continue to sell the games and add more titles to the range. And now on to the top selling games. Games coming into the chart this month include 3D Tank Duel from Real Time Software. Battle Zone in the Arcade was a popular attraction, and this is Real Time's version, featuring more colour and good gameplay. Next we have Artomania from Microgen. This nice little platform game introduces Microgen's new character, Wally Week. Wally has to collect the parts of a car and take them back to the garage where he can build the complete car before driving it away. Each level had a different car to build, which kept play interesting. Next we have Cavalon from Ocean. This arcade clone sees you playing a knight who has to make his way through six levels of the castle while avoiding chasing enemies and collecting parts of the door to allow access to the next level. And lastly, Rapscallion from Bugbite. This strange looking maze game gives the player the ability to change forms from a bird to a fly. And when you die, the game does not end, but you become a ghost. You then have to find your body to continue. The instructions are very dodgy though. Apparently to get pixies to give you gifts, you have to touch them. Yeah, right. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from September 1984. It was inevitable that someone would take the step of producing a magazine in electronic format, either for free inclusion in an existing publication or to be sold separately. 
The advantages of this were obvious. Less space to store your ever-increasing magazine collection, real screenshots of games, typing games that actually worked and didn't require typing in, and that nice warm feeling that you were moving into the future of electronic publishing, something that is only just maturing with the tablet revolution. The disadvantages, of course, you couldn't just pick it up and flick to a review or an article that you wanted. You obviously had to work your way through the tape to find the right section. The first tape magazine for the Spectrum was called Spectrum Computing, launched in May 1983 by Argus Publications. The contents were wide-ranging and included features, game reviews, games and useful routines. The games initially were just type-ins, for example this Aliens game from issue 1. Because of this new format though, and the removal of pages worth of code, games could become more complex and even include machine code. Here is Archaeologist from issue 18, a nice little jet set willy clone. The layout of the magazine left a lot to be desired, but did improve over time, with the inclusion of larger headline text, better navigation and border effects. Other tape-based magazines weren't far behind. Hot on the heels of Spectrum Computing came 1648, released in November 1983. Attractively mounted on a colourful card, this had quite a large following and a much improved look. Taking two sides of the cassette it included good quality games, reviews, news and even an adventure help section. I always looked forward to reading that section because I was terrible at adventures. The games followed the same path as Spectrum Computing, with basic games slowly but surely giving way to machine code ones. This is Elevator from issue 9. A simple game, just rescue the man, but you have to avoid being directly under the UFOs. Hiding under pillars can help, but you have to time your movements to avoid losing energy. Later editions of the magazine came with an ongoing graphic adventure called The Long Way Home. No doubt a market employ to get you to buy the next issue, but still a good game. Other tape magazines quickly followed. Outlet, starting in March 1987, ran for over 140 issues and included reviews, routines and features. The magazine was also available in various formats including tape, microdrive and disc. There were also specialised magazines like Spectrum Adventurer, beginning life in 1986 and obviously deals with just adventures. The tape consisted of the usual editorials, game reviews and adventure help. There was also magazines aimed at specific hardware, for example the Spectrum Discovery Club. This was a disc magazine produced for directory Opus users and was available on disc only. Sadly it seems the idea of producing magazines for the Spectrum on tape or disc has faded. There were still a few Russian ones around, and there's the odd one that pops up on the forums now and again. It's quite nice to sit down and read through a few issues of these magazines. You get to feel a little closer to what was actually happening in the Spectrum days. So when you're next time with your group of friends and they all get out their iPads and start harping on about ooh, all the magazines that they can read, just tell them that, hey, You've been doing it since 1983, it's nothing new. Fearless Fred the intrepid archaeologist finds himself in the creepy catacombs of Tutankhamun. His task is to get out, collecting any treasures on the way. Fred only has his trusty gun with five bullets for protection, but luckily there are bullets lying around to reload. 
Fred, released in 1984 by Quicksilver, is a side-on arcade maze game. Almost a bit like a side-on version of Maziacs, but with more features. The huge pyramid scrolls somewhat jerkily as Fred moves around, jumping gaps and climbing ropes. There are evil things in here too, all set on the demise of Fred, and all sap his strength when they come into contact with him. There are acid drops that have to be dodged. There are rats that look somewhat like hedgehogs that have to be jumped over. For some reason he can't shoot them. There are ghosts that float around and move through walls, and if you shoot them they just change direction. On later levels there are chameleons on the walls, and to avoid them Fred has to swap sides while climbing ropes. There are also mummies, vampires and skeletons, all of which can be shot, or of course you could just run away. You may be lucky enough to find a map. This will show you a small section of the pyramid you're actually in at the moment, and hopefully help you avoid dead ends, of which there are quite a few. So, the object is to run around, climb higher and higher, because the exit is at the top, avoid the many nasties, and collect the treasure, and shoot things if required. The game is a nice mixture of things that come together to form a rather enjoyable game, only let down by the jerky scrolling. According to the game, the maze is different every time, and there are five levels of play, if you can get that far. I remember as a teenager finding the exit and being ecstatic. I still got a buzz when I found it during the review. Strangely, this game can be quite relaxing to play. The pace is slow, but at the same time you get that feeling of not knowing what's going to happen next, especially on later levels, where you can suddenly find a mummy plummeting down a passageway towards you, having fallen off a level above. If you like the pace of the gameplay, and you can put up with the jerky scrolling, then this is a nice little game, and I can promise you, once you find that first exit, you'll be back for more. Ghosts and Goblins was released in the arcade in 1985, and proved to be a huge success. You play Sir Arthur, out on a quest to get back the princess stolen away by the demon in the intro sequence. Along the way you can pick up different weapons, replenish your armour, and collect bonus points. But each section has a time limit attached, meaning it's action all the way. The arcade game is considered to be very difficult, due to the time limit and number of hits the player can take before he dies, which is only two. The first one removes his armour, and the second one kills him. It was also very colourful, with nice graphics, good sound, and large multi-directional scrolling map. So how would the Spectrum version compare? I'll say this from the start. Contrary to many players, I don't like this game. Not because of any preconceptions, but because I wasted so much time trying to get somewhere with this game just to do the review, and not managing to get anywhere at all. So let's start from the beginning. The graphics are average, the sprites are about the right size, well defined, and move nicely. Unless, of course, you find yourself stuck behind a gravestone or some other block. If this happens, you can only jump vertically, which limits the gameplay tremendously, and means that you're an easy target for zombies. The levels match the arcade game, with obviously not the same amount of colour. This could have been improved, I think, but it was done this way to keep the scrolling smooth, as the colours are in bands across the screen. There's green at the bottom, yellow in the middle, and cyan at the top. The sound is terrible. Yes, it's only a 48k spectrum, but we should expect better than this. All we get is simple clicks when something gets killed. There's no firing sound, no bonus sound, no enemy firing sound, and there can be long periods of silence. Next, onto the gameplay itself. The arcade game in the introduction was me playing for the third time. I managed to get to the end of level 1 on just three plays. 
Maybe I was lucky, but the game was forgiving enough in my opinion. The Spectrum version, well, after almost two hours of playing, I haven't even got past the first boss on level one. Most of the time I couldn't even get that far. This leads to frustration and several times I had to actually walk away, make a cup of tea, sit down and read some emails and then try again. It was just so infuriating. After a few more hours, I finally got to the second stage of the first level. This took another 30 minutes to beat, using a save game. And when I finally got onto level 2, this was even harder than the first. With monsters popping up right next to the player, moving about randomly, and an awful colour scheme that made locating enemies difficult at best. So after over 4 hours of trying to like this game, I had to give up. I'm not a brilliant game player, but clones of arcade games surely should have the same difficulty level as the machines themselves. If this was the case then I may have liked this game, but it isn't. I know I'm going against the grain here, but this game, for me, is a poor conversion that is just too difficult to play. If you like pain, or can complete the arcade version with one hand tied behind your back and your eyes closed, give it a try. Otherwise, stay clear. After two warring nations have ceased hostilities, refugees were still being held by automated systems and a hero is needed to go out and rescue them. Step forward, Sergeant Helmet. This game, released in 2009 by the Mojo Twins, is one of the most colourful games I've seen on the Spectrum and it still manages to play and move really well. Sergeant Helmet is plunged into a strange land where he has to fight his way across platforms inhabited by creatures called Sputs and guarded by automatic gun turrets. Your health goes down quickly when hit, but luckily when you destroy a gun turret you can replenish your health back to 100%. This is a major part of the game, and although the sputs can be largely ignored, doing so with the turrets will give you a real short game. There are four levels, each holding ten refugees, and each level getting harder. Some of the jumps are really tricky to complete, so mastering the jump control is essential if you want to get far in this game. The trickiest ones are when you have to jump from beneath a platform, jumping both sideways and up so you can reach safety. Most of these tricky jumps allow you to return to the lower platform if you mistime your jump, and again mastering this will get you far in the game. If you do miss the jump you have to quickly change direction and allow your player to fall back onto the initial platform. Missing any of the platforms will see Sergeant Helmet plummeting to his death. The music that plays along is great and really suits the game and it certainly gets you hooked in as you bound across the screen blasting away. The graphics, as you can see, are very impressive, and the overall gameplay and pace are spot on. This is not an easy game though, so patience will pay off, and you really do have to learn the jumping controls. It took me a few attempts to learn how to do it properly, and as I played again, each game I got further. This is a great game and highly recommended. Give it a try. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help making the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.